and welcome to Raising the Bar with the MBBA. I'm Adiola Adejobi. And I'm Jason Clark, president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. The MBBA is the largest association of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. The goal of Raising the Bar with the MBBA is to identify justice issues affecting our communities while also trying to identify solutions in the process. Today, we're going to discuss the challenges that formerly incarcerated individuals endure when attempting to successfully reintegrate into society. Today's guests include Community Affairs Liaison at the Doe Fund, Adjunct Professor at New York University and Co-Chair of the MBBA's Reentry Committee, Terrence Coffey, and Special Projects Manager, Circles of Support, and the second Co-Chair for the MBBA's Reentry Subcommittee, Thomas Edwards. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. Thank you, Terrence, for being with us today. So I think a great place to get started is just the fact that, you know, every year about 600,000 folks are released for incarceration. And many of them find themselves having to deal with, uh, you know, issues when it comes to housing, employment, and discrimination. Uh, can you tell us a little bit why, about why it's important that we have reentry services and what some of the thing, those things should look like? Well, um, Jason, Adele, we want to thank you again for having us here. Um, and that was truly a great question. Uh, when we think of reentry and we think of those individuals coming home, we also have to remember that these individuals also, uh, people who were part of our communities prior to going to incarceration. Right. Uh, one of the mandates of our Department of Corrections is also to rehabilitate. And with that idea of rehabilitation comes the idea of investing in reentry, which is another aspect of the criminal justice system that somehow gets lost in these conversations. But yet it's one of the most critical aspects of this conversation uh, if we begin to think about the recidivism rates here in America. So what we try to do in, in our conversations is really focus on providing the necessary resources uh, that the formerly incarcerated will need in order to build successful and productive lives who will, again, become a part of our community. Absolutely. I, I mean, with 90% of people going to prison coming home, you need to help them come back into the community. We talk about reentry, but a lot of times what we need to talk about is just entering society. Because a lot of these people went to prison, they was in a subculture. They never had credit cards, they didn't have proper ID, they didn't have education, they didn't have any skills. So they lived in a subculture and survived. And then they went to prison and now they're coming back. So what do we want them to do? Go back to what they knew before? Or do we want to give them new tools and resources? And we spent a lot of money putting them in prison. Let's spend some money keeping them home. Yeah, and I think you actually brought up a good point there because when we're talking about, um, you know, for people being in, in, in jail for 25 to even 10 years, like mm -hmm. the world is very different Absolutely. now sure. um, than it was before. And Absolutely. so thinking about how we implement programs to help and support them it has to look very different. It has to change. And, and those programs really need to be intermittent while they're in prison. Mm -hmm. That's when reentry should start. As many, the minute you go into prison, that's when rehabilitation really just, just should begin. And it also seems like nowadays there's a lot of momentum about actually having changes when it comes to reentry. And you know, it seems like there are a lot of um, bills that are being um, advocated for, a lot of uh, changes that people want. Can you tell us a little bit about if there's some type of political shift that seems to be going on when it comes to reentry? Uh, absolutely, and, and I would fully agree with you. I think in the past 10 years, we have been, we, we began to see a political shift uh, in perspective, not only from a legislative uh, uh, view, but also within our society. And I think a lot of that uh, has to do, first of all, with the Obama administration. I think uh, President Barack Obama was probably one of the first sitting presidents that began to bring this uh, issue to the, the forefront. Um, Secondly, I think that in the past couple of years that uh, individuals who of star power who got involved in this conversation, such as Jay-Z, such as Meek Mills, we can look at Kim Kardashian and all these names and people began to get involved in this. And um, I also think uh, the issue, and, and sadly, as I, as I mentioned, uh, that the issues of po police brutality and began to really inundate our screen, TV screens, that it, it was almost like it was a repetitious pattern 
that we would see it happen in this state or this state. And I think that involvement of individuals as uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, and, and, and th those groups getting involved in this conversation uh, really brought this conversation to the forefront. Um, and it really began to address some of those issues that uh, impacted black and brown communities, specifically in that area. And lastly, as I said earlier, one of the things, um, and, and I, I like to say, we, we, we gained some strange bedfellows in this conversation, as well as well as support, and that came from the right. And uh, I do not want us to create another Van Jones moment, so let me clarify. Uh, the rights position in this conversation. It, I, I do not think that any point in time that the conservative right uh, in regards to criminal justice reform woke up with some type of spiritual awakening mm -hmm. on the, the moral cost uh, or degradation to black and brown communities. I think that the rights involvement in this conversation was more from a financial perspective. Uh, Federal and state governments could no longer sustain under an $80 billion budget. Uh, when we began to see individuals such as Newt Gingrich, when we began to see think, conservative think tanks, uh, tanks as Alec getting involved into these conversations with these new initiatives, what this was approached uh, to do was to address mass incarceration by bringing down the numbers, but additionally, the cost. Right. So we gained some strange bedfellows in this process, uh, and I think that over the period of time and years, this is where this has brought us to the forefront in this conversation. Yeah, and I think also in terms of like implementing of some of these changes and, and thinking more creatively about how we can accommodate um, people that are re-entering, uh, New York has been very uh, progressive, if mm -hmm. you will, in, in terms of that. And can you talk a little bit more about the ban the box rule? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll let you go first on Ban the Box. Uh, Ban the Box was legislation that was introduced in uh, 2015 and 16 was, it was enacted. And what this legislation did was kind of, you know, it didn't kind of, it actually made it illegal for employers to ask formerly incarcerated people or anyone, have you ever been incarcerated? And that came about through research and data through the uh, EEOC, which began to, to reflect and show that men who were formerly incarcerated were being discriminated against in the search or pursuit of, uh, of employment. Now, what happened, you know, if you, you have to go back two years because there was, as you said, New York took a very progressive sta uh, stance in regards to criminal justice reform. So there was this great investment in training. There was this great investment in uh, uh, skill sets. It was all this was being done. And what we were finding out, this same training investment that we were putting in our criminal justice system for these men, they were getting out and not able to get jobs. So uh, that push was led by our new public advocate, Jamani Williams, um, I believe, and he, you know, in, in the band of box idea is to give men the opportunity to uh, secure employment without being judged on their past. And I think, as I said, uh, this is kind of with the idea of what Dr. King said, you know, judge a man by the content of his character and not the color of his skin. And same way this, this, this legislation does the same thing. We say we want to judge a man on where he's at today and not his past. Yes, men and women. And women. <laughs> and, and women. And women. <laughs> and women. Well, it's, it's important to me because women is the rising demographic going to prison. While men are decreasing, women are rising All the fastest mm -hmm. throughout the state. And at exactly. least 35 state women are being arrested quicker than men at a higher rate and going to prison. So that impacts the family in a much greater way than just when men go. Yes, and then also, um, you know, and we talked about this, I guess, you know, before the show, but when you were talking about how families, uh, when women go to jail, the family is impacted in a way that's a, a, a lot more Absolutely. significant. And, and reentry should be different for women when we think about that because when a man comes home, the first thing he needs is an apartment and a job a woman need to get her kids back because I think mm. it's like 75% of women in prison are mothers. So the first thing they need to do is find out how can they connect with their children. Right. So it create a whole different set of dynamics for them. Right. And so. it needs to be different designed just for women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, this, so this actually seems like a, a nice place to start talking about 
you know, programs or things that should be done. So ban the box, that certainly sounds like mm -hmm. that's been a positive development. Uh, you know, Terrence, Thomas, you guys are in charge of uh, um, all reentry that's gonna happen here in New York. You know, what is it you guys want to get done or what do you think would really make a difference in the lives of folks? Well, one of the first things that I think that uh, Thomas has already said it, the idea that reentry begins uh, when you're released is probably the, one of the first, one of the most problematic idea, you know, approaches. The first thing we want to do is actually begin this reentry process for men who, while they're incarcerated, uh, we want to connect with these men and building relationships with them. Uh, prior to their release. And upon that release, uh, we have this idea of this care package, which includes the state ID, which includes the social security for a person uh, and, and those type of things. Because for a person re being released from incarceration, coming back to mainstream to society here in New York State, as of now, men are given $40 in a bus ticket wherever you're at in this state. Um, and that's reflective of, of what happens throughout a country. Now, if a person with our, just today, with the cost of living, you get out with $40 and a bus ticket, you're probably gonna get a hot dog and a soda and then you're on your own. And I think it's important that we connect these men and women uh, with the necessary resources when it comes to housing, when it comes to employment opportunities, when it comes to a transition support team that meets that person at the gate for those individuals who do not have families, for those individuals and families that do have families, that we build relationships with those individuals to also assist them in this process as well. Because sometimes uh, a lot of our uh, formerly incarcerated and coming home uh, face challenges internally due to, you know, uh, stresses and uh, trauma that occurred during this incarceration process. So building a, 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 a support team is critical in that process. You had mentioned state ID. So, Thomas, can you explain a little bit about uh, that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you, you need a state ID to do just about anything. For instance, if you're being released and you had a, a drug case, you're going to be mandated to do some type of drug therapy. So in order to get in the program, you would need a Medicaid card. In order to get a Medicaid card, you would need a New York State ID. But to get a New York State ID may be simple for most people, but someone coming from prison, you don't have a bill in your name to say you live somewhere. You may not even have your Social Security card because you've been in prison, you just didn't have it. So one of the first things you need to do is create some type of way where you could get this ID as soon as possible so you could do the other things you need to do. You know, one of the things in prison, reentry should start right away. So education and skills should be something that's given you, you know, freely. I mean, teach people how to be plumbers, carpenters, you know, other ones who want to go to college, let them get bachelor's degrees. Studies have shown that education, the higher the education, the less likely you are to go to prison in the first place. And studies have also shown once you're educated in prison, the less likely you are to come back, the higher the education. I believe with a master's degree, it might be like 5% go back. Whereas with a high school diploma, maybe 80% go back. You know, so these are things you could do right off the bat. And I mean, you have people that go to prison extremely academically inclined. They never knew it. They never had a chance to go to school. Right. You know, they was living day to day any way they could. So these are things you could do once a person is in prison prior to them even getting out. Yeah, and I think just to add on, one of the things that we also, that, that, that's usually a challenge specifically uh, with, with particular groups is, oh, it's just gonna cost us more. Um, th that, and that's not the case, and that's something I think that needs to always uh, be reiterated in these conversations. Um, the fact that we spent over $80 billion annually to incarcerate people, what we wanna do with those same funds, we're not asking for a penny more. We can just take those same funds that have already been vested in car incarcerated people and redirecting those funds into what we like to say a common sense approach in, into incarceration. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeing a lot of that's happening now, uh, th that's happening on a, on a state level, uh, federal level. We're taking a more common sense approach. Yeah, right. and can you, can you talk more about how this common sense approach is affecting black and brown communities? You want to? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was definitely. <laughs> he was ready for that. Yes. I think whenever you talk about brown and black communities, you talk about communities that have been, you know, have lack of resources, have been criminalized for some of their, you know, regular behavior, let alone 
or the stigma attached to just being brown or black in this country. You, you know, you could go back to the Constitution, how it was set up, who it was meant for. You could go back to the, uh, you know, the, the uh, establishment of the police in this country, slave patrols in the South, property protection in the North, things that black people had nothing, no property, and you were a slave. So the police was never meant for you in the first place. So this created certain things in those communities. And when you can go on, uh, you know, the media and see brown and black people treated certain ways, their communities policed certain ways, it pretty much give, you know, people could treat you any way you want, and it creates this thing where you devalue yourself. And that's what happens in our communities. And, you know, when someone comes from prison, like someone would say, well, how do you handle that stigma? See, but if you've been brown and black in this country, you know about a stigma. Right. That's just another thing to deal with. And it's not something that, that you're going to allow to stop you. But at the same time, we should be honest about how things got like this. It wasn't by accident. It was by design. And brown and black people need to sit at the table. And not just sit at the table, but make most of the decision. Right. Because when you come somewhere, the people affected most really know how to fix it. If they're given the proper resources and help. And I think this is what need to be, you know, we talk about the Second Chance Act and these different things. A lot of that comes with money, grants and different things for our different programs. But we need the right people in our communities running them. And why shouldn't the people in those communities run these things and keep that money in the community? You know, they talk about uh, economics, and a lot of this has to do with economics. Uh, Terrence brought up the right being a part of this, you know, reform. The Koch brothers, billionaires, are part of this. They have conference about prison reform, which I think is great. And I don't care why they do it. Let's take advantage of it and move some of that money where it should be. Because a lot of this is about money. And not just money, but what we can do with money and the resources we can create and the educational opportunities that we can make happen. And I think that's how we need to look at brown and black communities as the way they send aid to other countries we need aid in our communities That's true. and respect in our communities. Yeah, yeah because one of the things, that I, and I have to say this, a lot of times you, the conversation surrounding the criminal justice reform and its impact on uh, the individuals in black and brown communities, I think it, it, that somehow gets lost because of that, that we forget that these same communities that we're talking about, these black, they were already historically marginalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were already economically deprived. They were already uh, ignored by our state, federal governments. And we could, you know, right here now we have the conversation. Uh, we have one of the representatives from Washington going to the NYCHA homes mm -hmm. uh, and finding, and these are the people who have never been to prison. These are the, the mothers who said, can you guys just take out my trash? Can y'all just clean up this place? Can y'all just, th these communities have been historically marginalized um, in s just, just period. An individual who's a part of that community who goes to prison, the only thing that that situation does is compound the, the problems for this individual who already came out of this marginalized community. He's compounded by the, the stigma of being incarcerated. And when this individual is released, if we refuse to invest or take the time and invest in this individual, and not just this, the individual, because it shouldn't take individuals going to prison or to our criminal justice system in order to get the necessary trainings and have the economic opportunities and the educational opportunities to succeed. Because when we do that and we, we focus in on that, which is critical, we also have to remember that this is the same individual who's going to be released going back to the same historically <coughs> marginalized, economically deprived community. Right. So there's also an investment in the community that has to take place as well. Uh, if we want to talk about a true uh, a second chance, not just in the life of the individual who's impacted by this criminal justice system, but also that individual who came from this economically deprived community prior to prison. So I, I just had to make that. No, and that so yeah, it's, it's that. an important point. That's great. And, you know, and especially when you're talking about this investment in the community, uh, there are a lot of statistics out there that show that, you know, once someone has been incarcerated, there's a higher level of recidivism. I, mean, I think at some point it was, you know, two thirds of folks who have been incarcerated uh, end up being back incarcerated within just like a few years. Right. So 
what are some of the things specifically when it comes to tackling recidivism that we should be looking at and doing so that we can make sure folks who, who admittedly will be coming back to some of the same situations when they're mm -hmm. out, of, um, um, out of jail, you know, what are some of the things that could be doing to make sure that they have every opportunity to uh, improve their lives? Well, I, I think that's the point right there, the opportunities. Mm -hmm. you, you know, like when, when you play basketball, you coach. You don't put a big kid as a point guard. You put him down low so he could dunk the ball. Mm -hmm. I mean, you give people a chance to succeed in life. So if you take a, a young person away from his community, even at 16, 17, and you only take him away for three years in a prison mm -hmm. with adult males that, that know more crime than he does and that he can learn more crime from. But then not only that, you put him right back in the community he left. He comes home with more resources, but criminal resources. Mm -hmm. So when, what we need to do is start replacing the resources. See, in our community, they have resources. <laughs> you know, but it's the guy who sells drugs. It's the guy who sells guns. These are the things that are more available to young people in our community, in black and brown communities. We don't normally see lawyers and judges in our communities, and we don't know that we could talk to them. So this is a dream. This is another side of life. So what, what we have to do in these communities is connect them because there's subcultures going on there. And what we need to do is connect them to the whole society and make society somewhat responsible for them because we should be re responsible for each other in our society. And I don't think that, that, you know, there is a place for prisons. There is a place for parole and all those things, but it should be done in a way that promotes public safe, safety, not make it less you know, because when you start in prison with education, it changes so much. And you talked about the 65% uh, the that go back after a certain amount of years. With a bachelor's degree, with a, you, you know, every degree, it goes down, the number. So this, to me, should be something that we should want to do prior to them going to prison. Because a lot of young people that are going to prison, they grow up in a life of somewhat where crime is not accepted, not just accepted, but it's expected. Like, you expected to go get yours. Mm -hmm. And we have turned things in our community around, like Michael Max said, by any means necessary. He never meant committing crimes. He had changed his life from that. So that's definitely not what he meant. So we, we kind of have to educate our young people to their value and also to the criminal justice system that it wasn't set up for them to be treated fairly in. So the best possible way is to keep our young people out of that system to start with. But with the reentry, we just have to really concentrate on giving resources and opportunities, because that's what it's really about. And one of the, the things I want to highlight, because I, I, I'm, I'm an I'm a idealist and I believe in the, the hope and thing, but I also need concrete steps to help us navigate forward. And one of the programs that I noticed here in New York was the Jails to Jobs program that was introduced by Mayor DeBill de Blasio for people who were transitioning out of incarceration, coming back home, that they were given, uh, the, the, through this program, were giving, I think, jobs for three or four weeks. Now, mm -hmm. the problem with that, you can't, you can't incarcerate someone for over a year and then they get out and you're going to give them a job for two weeks or three weeks. I don't know what. So I think there, we, we have some models there that we can expand on uh, that can provide. The first thing is economic opportunities. The second thing, particularly here in New York in, in relation to uh, Charles Matthews case, who was just recently released under the First Step Act. Um, and because of his criminal background, he found it difficult to get housing in which uh, Kim Kardashian stepped in and she's assisted in that manner. So I think that there ought to be some type, there, there should be subsidized housing for men who are formerly incarcerated and families of those who are impacted by our criminal justice system as they transition out. Um, I think there should be an investment in educational programs and training programs with organizations we already have. There's no way in, in my, my mind I see where we need to reinvent any wheel. I think that Thomas just said it. It's just more so investing in the programs that we already have on the ground that's seeking to help this population. But again, uh, this the idea of anyone saying to me, or I think any advocate, that we do not have the necessary resources to do that is problematic. When we know you, you, you know, you ran a system for over 20 years that costed our country. $80 billion per year. So we have the resources. 
It's and just a matter say, of that. Yeah. Sorry, and then when you say the education programs that are out yes. there, I just want to make sure we get this in there. Yes. Um, but can folks get degrees? Can people get certificates if they're incarcerated? Yes. Right now, uh, they're, they are now introducing uh, new programs that will bring back the Pell Grant which will allow per, a person who's incarcerated to pursue an academic education. One of the groups that I work with also here in New York for formerly incarcerated men is College Initiative. And this is a program that takes a vested interest in men or, and women who have an interest in pursuing higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are so many other organizations that, that have uh, this model, the models in place and are assisting people. Mm -hmm. But again, if we're not going to take a vested interest in the reentry aspect in, in light of a, a national recidivism rate of 77 percent. When we began to do the cost analysis, because it's going to it's going to look like my mother said, it's going to you, you're going to pay now, you're going to pay later. But in the end, you're going to pay. And again, w what we're only approaching as advocates and as the, the work that we do, we want to now take a common sense approach to some of these most critical issues that are impacting individuals transitioning out. And, and some of that is just a matter of creating and supporting support systems that are already here in place. Uh, speaking of uh, education in prison, uh, in New York State, you could definitely get a degree uh, up to a master's degree. However, if it's five percent of the population in New York State who is offered that, mm -hmm. that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So that tells you that it's not really something that you can look forward to having if you go to prison in New York State. Very few people actually can go to college, and it's all about private donors, donations from people. Because, as he pointed about the Pell grants, they was taken away. One of the things was that why should they get a, you know education? But my thing is why shouldn't they get one? They should get one so they could change certain things. And not only that, everybody should get a free education, not just prisoners. I mean, right. don't say prisoners shouldn't get it because other people don't get it. No, everyone should have a free education in this country. And education changed so much in prison. So it's yeah. something we should really look at. And there's a number of organizations, Hudson League for Higher Education mm -hmm. in Prison, uh, you, you know, they're in seven or eight prisons, some women prisons, because education really allows them, it, it changes your life once you come out of prison, if you're willing to work with it. Yes, and I'm, that's a great way for us to end our show, because unfortunately we're out of time, even though there's so much more that we can talk about here. So I want to thank our guests, Terrence Coffey and Thomas Edwards, for walking us through some of the challenges that those who are formerly incarcerated uh, deal with and they, what they face with when they're attempting to successfully reintegrate into society. Yes, so to all of you, thanks for watching Raising the Bar on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. See you later.